Thank you. What, a, what an absolutely beautiful introduction. Isn't it funny how you meet people and you just have these moments? And I feel like I've, it's been so that way with so many of you in this room, which is part of why Amy and I feel so strongly that we need to have events like this where we come together and remember that because I think sometimes you do feel alone caring for people. And there we can do it better with the village. Um, so the village, the village of people who I got to submit selfies. <laughs> um, here's why this matters. It matters to kind of put out on social media that we care about mental illness, that mental illness affects all of us, that everybody that wants to ring that bell that has cancer should get to ring that bell. Um, because healthcare is a human right, right? I mean, and if we all stand together, it, it's better. And you'll see those selfies reflected in, in larger art pieces in the, in the side room, and I really do encourage you to, to go and look at it. For me, it's really been reflective of the fact that this isn't just about me or Amy. This is about the members of our collaborative taking ownership for what they care about um, and advancing equity in, in the way that means to them, and so that's very encouraging to me. So we heard about Susan Sontag earlier, right, and the stigma that used to be so prevalent um, about cancer. Now, why is there less stigma about cancer and HIV now? I think primarily because we have treatments that work. <laughs> That's probably the number one reason, but it's also because we got a lot better about talking about it. Um, you know, and I do think that the act of speaking about mental illness is critically important. It's critically important to show examples of people who are both suffering like the person we just heard about in some ways, and also show portraits of people who are doing pretty well. Um, that's important. So Stephanie London, who's one of the chairs of our advocacy committee and a beautiful photographer, took, took this selfie. And she writes that the stigma of mental illness isolates us from the world and the people around us, even from our doctors. It makes it difficult for people with serious mental illness to get the equal health care we deserve. And that's why when you have an opportunity to create a board, a stakeholder board, which brings together patients and caregivers and clinicians and researchers and talk about rigorous research together, it's critically important because it can actually help to change people's perspectives and, and feel more heard. Okay, so if you Google Cancer Center and you Google Mental Health Clinic, this is what you see. Um, it's critically important. <laughs> you see the fragmentation. You see the lack of equal investment I'm in that shiny glass building that I work in in Milwaukee 10 versus the concrete kind of, I don't know what it is, closed in brutalism um, of, of the mental health center. It sends a message. That's part of why we're here in this beautiful hotel, because we all deserve it. And mental illness is health care. It's not something that's over there. Separate is just like not equal, it never is. Um, so we can do that differently. Um, so individuals with serious mental illness are dying early. 30 years early, or 28.5 years, if you want to talk about the latest um, research that's been done. It's one of the largest disparities that's been documented in the United States. And 80% of that mortality gap is due to medical illness. The number one cause of death is cardiovascular disease, and number two is cancer, just like all of us. Um, very importantly, that's modifiable. So it's not just because of people have some health behaviors, and it's not to say that people don't have health behaviors. What I want to focus on is the fact that there are inequities in the continuum of cancer care that contribute to that mortality gap. And when we started to do the first series of, of research here, and we really examined that, we were really seeking to identify modifiable factors. And rather than it being the type of insurance or the cancer stage um, or other factors we looked at, the, the factors that were the most strongly associated with who got guideline concordant breast cancer care. So this is at a, a National Comprehensive Cancer Center. One in two women with schizophrenia got guideline concordant breast cancer care. One in two. That means one in two didn't. That's not very good. I don't feel good about that as a physician in the cancer center. But things were much better for people who were on an antipsychotic medication and who had a psychiatry consultation or at the time of diagnosis, or even had had to see a psychiatrist, had a psychiatrist on board. So that's something we can do something about. So I, I, I did want to reflect for a moment on Tom. <laughs> I know you guys don't really know him, but he was, people who knew him were here a minute ago. Um, so this bridge <laughs> reflects um, even another bridge that's really important. It's the Tobin Bridge to Chelsea. So in addition to the bridging that we talked about, about across disciplines, we also are talking about bridging to 
a diverse community that's often underserved, that often doesn't get talked about as much, and how many times we've gone over the Tobin. Not all of us have. How many people in Chelsea are coming here? Sometimes people haven't. So when I met Tom, when I was sitting in the room with him in my office, um, these are some of the things I, I noted, right? That there were loud voices telling him to end his life, that he had some depression and hopelessness. He stops his medication. He's alone. He's drinking alcohol every day. He has this profound history of trauma. Uh, he's on leave from work. He's agitated. He's yelling. Uh, he got banned from the bus, the bus, the public bus. He doesn't call people back, and mostly what I was struck with was this really profound level of suffering. The truth is there's another way to look at it. And this transformation for me has been incredibly important. When people ask me, Kelly, how do you do this? Or what's different? I think this is a piece of it. Because I really try, when I feel that moment of being like, oh my goodness, I'm so overwhelmed with how much suffering there is, I had to take a step back. And you know what I noticed? I noticed how beautifully dressed Tom was. I noticed he had these beautiful loafers and argyle socks. And he came right on time. And you know what that told me? That dignity, as for all people, but as particularly for Tom, was critically important. And you know, there are a lot of things I could have done in that moment. I, I could have said, I'm going to recommend this antipsychotic medication. You should really be on an injectable. Hey, let's go see radiation oncology. I, I don't think it's interesting what you're called to do when you just kind of let yourself be a little more creative. So here's what we actually did. I said, you know what I think we should do? Why don't we go for a walk to the healing garden? And so we got in the elevator together, and we took the elevator down two flights, and we went outside to the healing garden. And we sat there, um, and Amy came, I think, and sat there with us for a few minutes. And I think that um, I just felt I wanted him to know that this was a place where he'd be treated respectfully. And that was the first intervention that made it possible to put together all the rest of it. And that's scientifically important to study. Um, the fact that we were distilling that to that and do, approaching it in that way. That's person-centered care. Um, and isn't that what all of us need <laughs> and deserve in moments of suffering? Really, right? Regardless of our personal history, that's what everybody deserves. And I wish that our healthcare system could give. And you know, what might change if we actually just did it, if we actually just met people where they are? Because the truth is, although there's a, there are so many wonderful resources, at the end of the day, you're deciding how you're spending your time as a clinician. No one said, I'm going to pay you to go to the healing garden. Um, <laughs> no one said they weren't. I just thought it might work, so I did it. I was like, what the heck? Why not? Let's try it. <laughs> you know? And so I encourage all of you in the room to do that. So I wanted to take um, you know, a minute for the, for the rest of this talk just to reflect a little bit on where we've come over the past three years or four years. Um, since we first started talking about this need and noticed it, many of you in the community noticed people who weren't getting cancer care and weren't sure what to, what to do about it. Um, so we have done a series of studies, first in terms of the intervention to, to understand that it was possible to conduct research in this population with such high comorbidity, that it was feasible, that 90% of the people we approached consented, that we recruited four times faster than the goal. <laughs> because many people said to me, there's no people with, like that in our cancer center. Dr. Irwin, we don't, we don't see people like that. That's not here. And, and, and we can say that people don't say that. People say that to me every day. There's so, many prof there's so much profound ignorance that that's like that's a step to say that. So we did that first pilot study. Um, and now we're, we're starting the first randomized controlled trial in this population. And we'll talk more about that. Um, at the same time, we have also built this collaborative of more than 500 people um, nationally, internationally, who really are very curious and excited and motivated to contribute to it, to be able to say that we can increase access to this type of integrated person-centered care that all of us uh, deserve. So I'm inspired by that, by all of the people who are in this room doing that in our partnership with the Department of Mental Health and NAMI and North Suffolk. Um, and many other collaborators, including Mass General and Dana-Farber, for the people who are willing to think outside the box. I mean, I see the oncologists who are here, many of those people are also people who've thought out of the box. So um, we're rebranding. <laughs> we have a new logo we hadn't seen. So we are the Engage Initiative. We wanted to call it that because um, I think fundamentally it's about engagement, right? But we're also the Cancer and Mental Health Collaborative. 
And our mission, decided by everyone, not just me, um, is that mental health or mental illness should never be a barrier to cancer care. And that really it takes all of us to make this problem and this group of people who are invisible sometimes seen and give them a voice in, in that they deserve access to the highest quality research um, and that that's what we want to do because doing that research is critically important to change um, guidelines and standard of care, absolutely, much like advocacy work is critically important to get that research into practice. It really takes both. Um, and so we'll talk about um, some of the folks up there as we go forward on the progress. So I wanted just to kind of have that be a theme for us, like what the heck is person-centered care? Um, I think people say that a lot. And I made a mindful shift this year. I'm not going to say patient-centered care. I'm going to say person-centered care. And that's what I was trying to describe in that example with some folks up there who can, who can speak to that. And being able to add a navigator to our team. I don't know if Kriya, are you here? Kriya's here. <laughs> being able to add a navigator to our team has been so incredibly important with increasing our ability to deliver that kind of person-centered care, for someone to be able to go and spend four hours with someone to get them comfortable to come over to the cancer center. Um, to do 150 visits um, and more than 35 based in the community and innumerable phone calls and texts. Um, and then we also started an initiative because we noticed that when people were in the hospital, you know, when they got discharged, they weren't making it to the cancer center. You know, maybe they'd make it to rehab, maybe not. And there wasn't like a clear responsibility in who was caring for these patients until they got to the cancer center. And so we decided that we would proactively identify people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and cancer at the time of discharge and do collaborative care consults so that we'd focus on aftercare planning and try to bridge them to the community. And so the navigator role is critically important for that too, as well as Amy's um, as our social work case manager. In addition to our collaboration with the Department of Mental Health, has really been on board from the beginning and from North Suffolk, who are out there in the group homes and a lot of my friends and colleagues, they know their clients, they know the people they're serving, they know the people they're worried about. So to have a direct phone line to text to say, hey, what's going on? I mean, as I was sitting in the audience, I got three texts. I was like, oh gosh, I should probably respond to this. <laughs> um, but the truth is texting is efficient. That's how we communicate with our friends. It's, it works better. So what's the, why are we so scared of opening up that line of communication? I'm not sure, and I understand the, the sense that we might get overwhelmed. It's just for me has been really helpful. So hi, <laughs> Eddie's here, looks great. Um, I wanted to talk about our model of care just a little bit um, and why I think it's, it's person-centered. So here's a person, <laughs> that's important. She's a person who actually also has, uh, does some drama and um, tells her story with Girl Talk um, and has spoken and shared her story here. So here's an oncologist, not hers, but a nice oncologist at Mass General. <laughs> oftentimes it's just an oncologist and a patient in a room. That sometimes can work, but oftentimes it's really, really difficult to hear anything an oncologist says when they hear you have cancer. You don't hear anything else, and we all need advocates. So what about if instead we also had a psychiatrist and social work case manager who were on board to integrate their um, cancer and mental health care um, to proactively manage bipolar disorder and breast cancer at the same time while holding the person's needs in mind? And what if we had our navigator who could then um, go to her home, make sure that she could communicate us with a phone that worked, knew how to reach us. Um, and what about a visiting nurse who could go to her home and help to manage her medication and make sure she's taking it at a certain time? Those pieces were all incredibly critical to um, make cancer care go well, and then afterward, make care go well um, in general. So I mean, in addition, we are researchers. And we're researchers who are doing research a little differently, and Karen and Rob are going to talk about this, where we're doing person-centered research that incorporates people's perspectives on a topic that's oftentimes people felt hard to do research on. Um, and I want to just bring that person-centered lens to it. It's because it really describes the way kind of our trial works. Um, and so first off, we have to identify people proactively because people are not always identified who have serious mental illness. So we developed an algorithm to identify it through our medical record. And that, that's effective, but that wouldn't, miss, wouldn't get the most vulnerable people, right? That's why I need the collaboration with all of you, the people who don't get to the cancer center. That's why our colleagues at the Department of Mental Health and many other community mental health agencies and in shelters and prisons are so critically important. Um, sometimes people ask me, um, you know, how do you do consent in this population? So I think is a, we had a very mindful approach to consent. Now, standard research protocols, um, you were handed, in, a document of 15 pages 
of a lot of language, many of it kind of paranoia-inducing for anyone. It talks about lawyers. It's a lot of required language that's in, required. Um, and it's important conceptually to make sure that people know their rights, but hard to understand, particularly for when you use concrete language and need things to be kind of repeated. And so we said we were going to do verbal consent, and we're going to make it a, a conversation that happens over time. We're going to distill the information into small, digestible pieces. We're going to ask you if you understand. <laughs> we're going to document that. And we're going to have mental health clinicians do it. Um, and, and there's good data that shows that people with schizophrenia can provide consent. They, we can increase people's capacity to consent if we use a process like that. I think it makes sense, right? But for a lot of people, are like, verbal consent, right? That took like months of advocacy to get that through the Institutional Review Board. Um, and so I think then, and again, like the intervention itself, it wouldn't be very person-centered of me if I said I'm only going to see you in my office, right? That wouldn't be very... Unfortunately, it's what a lot of people do, because that's what they're used to doing. Um, and maybe it's the only thing that's possible within the realm of their fee structure or their clinic, but we had to go to radiation oncology, and then I was like, you know, we kind of really need to do more home visits, and what's up with all these rehabs? We really need to make some relationships there and go. And so having the team makes that possible. Um, so the research that's happening right now is this randomized controlled trial, which is going to examine the difference between our model, person-centered collaborative care, proactive identification, linked to a psychiatrist and social work case manager at the time of cancer diagnosis, a joint visit with oncology to develop an integrated cancer and mental health treatment plan, that's our model, versus enhanced usual care. And unlike a lot of collaborative care trials, we're not studying the impact on depression or psychiatric symptoms. Although we look at that and did sort of see a signal in the pilot, our primary outcome is whether or not they got their cancer care. And what we hope to show um, is that they were more likely to get their cancer care if they had this proactive approach. It's certainly something we saw a signal of in six patients in our trial. And then the next study, you know, maybe in one or two cancer types, multi-site, we hope to show a difference in mortality. Um, so that's kind of the vision. And I do think that there are a lot of creative ways that we can talk about disseminating this model um, in terms of having you know, a, a psychiatrist at a cancer center and social work case managers embedded. There are ways to do that. There's data on how to do that. Um, I don't have to be cloned. <laughs> there are other psychiatrists who we could pay to do that. <laughs> it's possible. Um, and we're also advocates um, here at the Cancer Mental Health Collaborative and the Engage Initiative, including Aidy, who's an advocate. Um, this is Edie's own words that she shared with me during our appointment. I was so struck by them, I actually wrote them on my whiteboard. I finally got a whiteboard. <laughs> I need a whiteboard. So I wrote them up, and this is what she said. I didn't feel wanted. I kept getting pushed around. I had a lump for six months, and I felt them dismissing me. And then what was, what was different here? The team listened to me, and that was the difference between life and death. Yeah. Um, okay. um, the reason it matters to do things like create art together, even though I don't usually do that, <laughs> it's not just to build morale, it's because creating things together outside of your role changes the way you think about people. And we all have the stigma of mental illness, myself included, and it changes the way I treat people to work with them outside of the room. And I can say of the things that have surprised me most as a psychiatrist this year, it's been how much better people get when we give people purpose and a role. I think it's almost as good as clozapine and certainly better than most other medications on the market. And so we should study that too. Um, so next steps. I just wanted to, um, Lori Worth is in, is in the room, I think. She's an oncologist um, at Mass General, who I'm very privileged to collaborate with, along with um, Dr. Bev Moy, many other wonderful people. Elise Park, who's a psychologist and my, one of my research mentors. We're, and we wrote um, an editorial commentary based on our, the last symposium. So if you guys were here last year, I wanted to share this as an update. We felt that it's wrong that 50% of clinical trials exclude people with mental illness. And by the way, I'm not talking about schizophrenia. I'm talking about all mental illnesses, which is like excluding 25 to 20% of the population for no clear justification. And ASCO, um, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, has made wonderful inroads about the importance of expanding access to clinical trials. And so we've been able to build on that by, by arguing that we also need to expand eligibility criteria for mental illness and that we have a moral imperative to gather generalizable evidence that can decrease disparities in cancer outcomes for a population that being people with mental illness 
facing significant barriers to care. So that'll be out on Monday. Take a look, let people know about it, um, um, and I hope that it will get some awareness and get this issue on the radar. Um, I also, this year, uh, I just am so struck by the wider community, and I've been so inspired to learn of the great work that's happening out there. And so I wanted just to give two shout outs to, um, and let them speak a little bit about their work. Dr. Karen Fortuna um, is a social worker and researcher um, and a assistant professor at Dartmouth. Um, and Rob Walker is, a, is um, a certified peer specialist and director of um, the Center for Recovery at the Department of Mental Health, particularly passionate about peer specialists for older adults. They have an amazing collaboration of creating research together and bridging um, technology and peer involvement in a way that can really move us closer toward equity. So I want to turn it over to you both. <laughs> 